Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. We are in a series that essentially the community has asked for, and it's called For the Love of Community and Friendships. Um, This is just a deal in the community. And I tell my guests this, like, kind of right out of the gate modern adult friendships are just a unique space that every one of us deals with, but not a lot of people are talking about. I mean, first of all, we are just women who are changing. I mean, I've changed uh, monumentally from my twenties to my thirties, from my thirties to my forties. And I know for sure I will change more in my fifties and beyond. And the things that are impacting me will as well. And so our priorities um, and our lives just evolve. And so subsequently, And a thing that we don't talk about a lot is that means a lot of our friendships will too. Um, And so as we get a little bit older, what we need becomes more defined or it might shift. Um, We may lose or gain friends depending on what season we're in or what season we left. Um, I have found personally that my core friend group has gotten smaller the older I've gotten. But with the strength of bond that I, I definitely didn't have, have when my circle was wider, which I, which was, that used to be kind of for sure in my thirties, um, really, really wide friend circle. And so this is a little bit different. Um, the older that we get for me and I've noticed, and I've seen the changes. And so, um, on top of that, I think outside of just the natural shift of friendships, which again, because people don't talk about a lot, it leaves us feeling adrift. Like, is this right? Have I done this wrong? Um, Did something go wrong in that a friendship that meant a lot to me 12 years ago is now a person that I don't talk to very much anymore? Or, you know, we have a lot of like, we attach a lot of um, emotion and even merit or morality to shifting friendships. But the truth is in a lot of ways, those are real normal. Um, that's, that's a really normal evolution in relationships as we get older. Um, and then there's another category, which is friendships that are unhealthy, um, that either always were, or they have become that way. And we're not super great with boundaries here at all. Um, by the way, on that note, if you haven't already, please go listen um, to my first interview with um, Nedra Tawab back in our For the Love of Reconnecting series on this very topic. I'll put the link up. Setting boundaries with friends is not something we always want to do, but absolutely necessary to keep relationships functional and healthy and connected. And so anyway, This week's guest, Erin Falconer, is such a good person to talk to about the ever-shifting adult friendship landscape. So she's written a book, and do not be put off by this title, which she talks about in the interview, um, How to Break Up with Your Friends, Finding Meaning, Connection, and Boundaries in Modern Friendships. I promise you, this this is not just a conversation or a book about how to just wipe the table clean of everybody you have that it's an intentionally provocative title, um, but an incredibly eye opening read. And, um, primarily this is a discussion on creating and maintaining the healthiest friendships at our ages. And as we evolve. And so Erin is so interesting. She's had a very, very career. She's originally from Canada and she's in LA now, She's done everything from writing screenplays. She's been a stand-up comic, a political consultant. Um, She's in the online writing world now. She's really fun. She's been the editor and co-owner of Pick the Brain, which is one of the highest regarded self-improvement communities on the internet. So she's a really great guide here and brings a lot to bear to this conversation. And so she's going to walk us through what she calls the six pillars of friendship and sharing everything from taking stock of who is in our life and how we are serving each other. Um, A big conversation on taking stock internally, a bit of a self-eval, which is where this starts, and maybe some of the most meaningful of all the work here, and then what to do 
when we see a friendship has um, run its course or needs to shift or change in some way. And so um, this is a really great conversation, one that I wish we were having so much more often uh, because I know from my community, because I'm always paying attention to you, we, we've had this conversation internally so often, which is just that adult friendships are the source of so much joy and also so much pain at our age. And so that's thus this entire series. And so I think you're going to find this conversation so eye-opening. And so please enjoy this discussion with the absolutely wonderful Aaron Falconer. Aaron, welcome to the For the Love podcast. I I'm just delighted to meet you. And I just told you, I've been so looking forward to this conversation. This is a common and consistent pain point Mm -hmm. inside my community. And so I promise you all my people were smashing the download (laughs) button on this episode. We're just really anxious to hear what you have to say. So thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You know, I, I love to talk about all things friendship. So I appreciate your curiosity. Absolutely. I've told my listeners just a little bit, kind of, I high leveled a little bit about you for them, but I wonder if you would just before we drill down into your work, give Mm -hmm. us a little bit of backstory on Aaron and where you are and how, kind of what your general deal is in life. Who are your people? Okay. Um, and how is it that you came to be doing what it is you're doing now? It's a lot. Pick, pick, pick whatever in there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So I am, as you mentioned, Aaron Faulkner, I am an author and also a psychotherapist and I am a Canadian living in Los Angeles I have had a very non-linear path to where I am right now. Uh, I talk about a lot about that in my first book, um, which kind of, among other things, centers a, a, a lot around the ability and the necessity of really listening to yourself and kind of turning the volume down on chaos to find out who you really are and how you want to show up in the world. And so through that, I started out going in one very different direction, which was like a type A fast track to law school kind of gal to a give it all up and cross, you know, the country uh, to come here to Los Angeles to be a writer, which Mm. failed spectacularly. Uh, I love it. Yeah, it was through those failures that I kind of found where I am now. Um, and happy to be here. Super happy yeah. to be here. Oh man, those failures are everything. I know them well. I know them intimately. <laughs> yep. They <laughs> We're do. Best in, friends. They're, they are our best friends. They turn out to be pretty profound road markers along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. Your work, your current work, kind of what we're here to talk about today is highly centered on adult friendships. Man, talk about a black hole of information, (laughs) of instruction, of Mm -hmm. modeling. Like it just feels like I've got five kids. And so I just know a lot about this. There's a lot around parenting our kids through this stuff totally, and helping an emerging teenager make this sort of choices. But then there's this like adult experience of friendships that is just as complex. So if not more so, frankly. And we're just like, who will help us? Like, so much of yeah. it feels disorienting. Am I normal? Is this normal? Am I the only one? So I find your work here really important and super, super necessary. And I'm sure the response to it confirms that. I mean, yeah. people are struggling here, right? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that I was how I came to this again, very kind of um, in an unexpected way. I was looking to write the follow up for my first book, which is in, as I said, it is in it. And it's it's very much in like a female empowerment space. And Mm -hmm. I was female productivity space. And I was looking for a follow up, couldn't come up with it. Dead end after dead end. Mm -hmm. And 
um, I remember I was like, kind of, I kind of had one idea that I was working on that my agent was like, nah. and I, mm. I, I, I was like, I, I like it, but I wasn't, you know, so, so sold on it, but I was getting super frustrated. I woke up one morning at like 6am half awake, half asleep. And this yeah. phrase break up with your friends was just in my head. And I was like, what? Oh God. I tried to go back to sleep. Couldn't really. And for the next couple of days, this just kept coming up. Mm surfacing. And I was sitting at lunch waiting for, uh, one of my, who on paper would have been called my, you know, best friends. Okay. And she was late, she's chronically late. Mm. And I was sitting there and I was so furious. Yeah. Like I was like, kept looking at my watch, looking at the door, where is she? You checked yeah. my phone. And I stopped myself and I was like, whoa, your degree of anger over this doesn't exactly match hmm. being late, right? So yeah. I started to look at it and I, as I was quickly kind of scanning through the recent years in the landscape of our friendship, I was like, whoa, like on paper, we're best friends, but man, there has, is like a chasm, like when, between hmm. the two of us, like I... Yeah which I'd never really contemplated before. I never yeah. even looked at it. And so I kind of had this epiphany in the moment where I was like, um, first of all, wow, I can't believe I'm in, we're in such a different spot than I thought we were. Mm. But number two, I can't believe this is the first time I'm doing this, like auditing yeah. a friendship in this way. Mm. So after lunch, she arrived, I went home and I was like, well, if this is the information I'm getting from this friendship, what about the other people? And so I started to go through a couple of the, you know, the major main yeah. starting line lineup friendships in my world. And it was all, it's not that it was all bad, but it was all sure. like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I was like, I can't believe this is the first time I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, we are a culture that is obsessed with information about ourselves. We know every calorie we're eating. We wear stupid yeah. watches that tell us the steps we're taking every step yeah. we take. Marie Kondo has us holding up chairs and sweaters and asking yeah, if they yeah. enjoy. And, but the people in this category, friendships, no eyes on, just kind of we're mm -hmm. friends and that's it. And so I was like, yeah. why is this? This is so weird. This can't just be me. So I started having conversations and lo and behold, everybody was like, oh, yes. Oh my yeah. God. Yes. And I, I was like, why is this? So I, started to bring it down to go back to the world I know, which is therapy. And in the world of therapy, you know, we have classic kind of therapy. You have individual therapy, couples therapy, family therapy, Sure, nothing for friendship. And what that meant to yeah, me is not necessarily point. that the people need to run out, friendship couples need to run out and get a therapist. Um, but what it means, although that's not a bad idea, if you are like, if you've been friends with somebody for 20 years and they are like mm -hmm. a foundational person in your life, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, another topic. But, um, what that means to me is there's no kind of collectively, collectively agreed upon language out there in the zeitgeist about how to navigate conflict in that's these relationships, true. a blueprint for what a good one looks like. Totally bad one looks like how to get out of good bad ones and into good ones and yeah. like if you think about romantic relationships there's all these you know unspoken processes in place right about you know signs when you're getting into a new relationship yeah. mapping out clearly what your needs are and what your wants are before you're getting into a romantic relationship should you that relationship break up there's all mm. this process around grieving the loss of that relationship you know talking to friends taking a day off from work taking mental health, health days but if this happens with friendship there's nothing so you're kind mm. of left to your own devices yeah and you know, we don't really talk about it and we, and we certainly don't talk about it constructively. It, it mm. always shows up in the form of like gossip sure, massive frustration, like yeah, passive aggression. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. So I thought this was a great idea. I put this together and, and, and sold this treatment February 23rd, 2020. Mm. Uh, oh, mercy. Okay. Oh, goodness. Yeah. I thought it was important then. Sure. Three months later, we were in a national yeah. lockdown. So you, and that's when the wheels really started to come off yeah. because we were put in all these micro bubbles right. cut off from these relationships were, you know, changed kind of forever. 
And then it was really kind of a reckoning about like, who is in my life? Who do I feel the need to connect, yep. reach out to? Who am I like, oh my God, I don't even miss this person or a sense of relief that I'm not having to like interact with them. And then as the pandemic went over, you know, then there was like an emerging anxiety as we were kind of going back into the world. And this is when yeah. the book actually came out because I'm publishing, <laughs> you yeah. know, as you know, it's like two and a half years later, the book comes out. Um, there was this anxiety about like, oh, now we're getting back into the world. Um, I don't want to go back to like, yeah. I did these default setting friendships, but I also don't have language on how to communicate that. Mm. Um, so anyways, yeah, it, there, there's been a lot of different responses and reactions mm. and yeah, it's been kind of intense. I'm sure it has. Um, I, I don't, I really don't know anybody that this doesn't affect as an adult, um, particularly like in a, a community of women, which is who I kind of serve. When life as I knew it imploded about three years ago with my divorce, there were just so many things I had to prioritize and actually just learn for myself. And one of the biggest categories was finances and its sidekick estate planning. You know, like wills and trusts, something nobody really wants to tackle or even really talk about. But this is so unbelievably necessary for our families, for our kids. And what I learned is it's not as hard as you might think, really. Like there are some incredible resources out there to take you by the hand and guide you. And that is exactly what this company called Trust and Will does. So Traditional estate planning can actually cost thousands of dollars, while those less expensive but just one-size-fits-all templates may not capture all the important details of, well, the life that you've built and you're still building. But with trust and will, you can protect your legacy from the comfort of your home starting at just $159. And the process is super straightforward. Their website is friendly and easy to use. They've totally simplified the process of creating and managing your will and trust online from finding out what's right for your family to finalizing documents with a notary. Every will and trust created is crafted to be state-specific and customized to your specific needs. Like, for example, things like care wishes or nominating guardians, final arrangements, power of attorney. They'll help you with all of this, you guys. Trust and Will also prepares and organizes your documents all in one place for easy reference or emergencies. And they secure your information with bank-level encryption. Plus, you guys, they have live customer service available through phone, chat, and email. So honestly, just gain peace of mind today with Trust and Will. You can get 10% off plus free shipping of your estate plan documents by visiting trustandwill.com slash for the love. That's 10% off and free shipping at trustandwill.com slash for the love. A fun thing for me that I've told you about before is that my 3 a.m. nighttime brain wants to wake up and think about, well, like health insurance premiums that are due and my children's future and the state of all of our cars and what I said that one time to that one person. But also a fun thing for me now is that 3 a.m. brain is no longer invited to the party because of one thing, focal CBD sleep gummies. They have changed my sleep game entirely. First of all, they work in that they have solved my middle of the night problems, but they're also yummy, like healthy sleep candy. I don't know what kind of magic makes them so effective because I'm not a scientist, but there's no weirdness in these. There's nothing bad. It's only good stuff only. Okay. So maybe you are a champion sleeper. If so, congratulations. And you just need a little focus during the day. Guess what? Focal has daytime gummies too. So I've got a code for you. If you want to change your brain game, for the love is your code to get 20% off at focal.com. But really, sleep is priceless. So you can thank me later. So that's focal, F-O-C-L dot com. And your code is for the love for 20% off. And so you, in this book, you've identified like what you see as six pillars of friendship. 
Mm-hmm. And I, this feels like a good baseline for our conversation today. Um, because those pillars really help us see, uh, what does a good friend look like? What does that mean? Um, which can be really helpful, um, yeah. at, as an analytic tool when yeah. we're maybe for the first time evaluating our friendships and yeah. trying to figure out if they're healthy or not. And so yeah. before we get into them, can you, can you sort of, can you explain what the six pillars are? Um, so then we can begin to slot some stuff underneath that. Yes. So I'm going off of kind of, kind of my memory here, but so fill in the, so fill, right. fill, fill in the blank. If I'm, I'm missing any, Right. but well, first of all, there's needs to be a sense of trust, yeah. right? You need to know that if you're, that there's like kind of a container around that friendship, so to mm-hmm. speak, in the sense that if you're sharing something that it's not going to necessarily go beyond that relationship, there has to be an underlying sense of positivity. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't mean that you can, you can get as real as you want um, with with within these friendships, they can good the the best of friendships can hold all you know mm-hmm. all the colors of the rainbow as a uh, you know that you bring. But the default setting on any one relationship should be one of positivity, mm. and it's so easy to slip into uh, negative thinking, negative conversation. Yeah because they feel so good. Like they feel mm. like you're seen and you're heard and done, but it's, you got to be really careful to not lean too heavily into those things. Okay. Um, you have to bring vulnerability. And this mm. is one of the ones that I was, you know, when I kind of had this epiphany at the beginning was like, I realized that I was, you know, showing up like as like a problem solver and mm. kind of like that person yeah. that's really like that rock, but yeah. I wasn't, showing up in any other way. So it was kind of like one dimensional. Yeah. Um, and so the ability to, to, tr- to trust, um, that you can show up as you are. So the flip side of the trust is showing y- y- the vulnerability. Yeah. Um, you, there has to be, um, um, an act, you have to commit to the relationship. So there needs to be a, a mutual commitment to this. And I think this is another one that's so easy to, especially in today's, like how cha- chaos driven we are. Like it's so easy with this category of relationship to be like, well, yeah, we're friends, but these relationships take work. You yes. need to show up. You need to commit to the other person. Um, mm. And you have to find your rhythm of what that looks like. It doesn't mean sure. you have to be getting dinner every week, but there has Mm. to be some kind of agreed upon what is the level of commitment in this. And it's, which is very similar, you know, to a romantic relationship. If one person is overly committed than the other, those things don't work. And so you really want to, again, and this is a lot with like that, as I like to say, that starting line of a friends, it's really important to be on the same page with where the relationship's at. So, uh, commitment, um, and, then I think one of the, the pillars is just understanding your, the, the, the your expectations mm-hmm. and, and what the expectations are, um, in the relationship. So getting really clear on that. So let's, let's parse some of these out here a little okay. bit. Um, okay. the title of your book, um, <laughs> puts forth the idea of how to break up with your friends, <laughs> right. um, which as you have stated is not simply just going through our contact list yes. with just a machete. That's not right. really what you mean here. Um, yeah. but that is funny because that's what our brains kind of default to. So what well, is it then? What is yeah. it? What, what does taking stock actually look like? Yeah. And so this is one of the things, this is one of the, the, the challenges with this book. Um, and I talk, as you know, I talk about this right at the beginning. So there's, this book is obviously called how to break up your friends, but there's only one chapter out of 10 mm. on how to exactly do just that. There sure. are nine chapters on the power and the value of these relationships, why they should not be um, underdeveloped, how much we're leaving on the table by not really showing up in a, in an intentional and committed way. Um, And then how to do them just a lot better. Uh, So, so, um, and it's been kind of, 
you know, as I said in the intro, like if I, well, first of all, this idea just literally popped into my head. So I really wanted to, there was something there for me about that. Um, but I also feel like if I'd written a title, like, you know, how to be better friends or mm, yeah, that nobody would have, they, everybody would have just walked by that book yeah. because nobody in that, cause we're not in the mindset to be active and intentional about being better in these relationships. So yeah. the title has been very jarring to mm-hmm. a lot of people <laughs> where they're like, I mm-hmm break up with my friends. I'm lonely. I need more friends yeah. like this, that, you know? And so, but this book is really like, the, you know, the other option for the title of the book was friendship therapy. Yeah. And that's really kind of more aligned with what this is. So to that point, and that's, and that's of course, great clarification. There's, there's <laughs> much depth to this yeah. book. Um, mm-hmm. that it's not just simply an exit strategy. Yes. Um, and so, I want to start with, cause you're, you walk through the pillars, you walk through essentially yeah. what it means to take genuine stock yes. of your friendships yeah. and to really sort of assess them with clear eyes right. and with truthfulness. Yeah. Um, and so I think my first question around that is, what do you see? What is, what have you either personally experienced or this is part of your research or both Hmm. as what are the primary deterrents here? In other words, why aren't we doing this? Why, why does this seem like monumental to do as grownups? Why, what, what is keeping us from evaluating our friendships? Like we do a lot of our other relationships. Right. So I think there's a, there are a couple of things. Um, number one, we have this idea and I'm not sure where it's come from. Um, that, that the, this category of relationship is just nice to have. Whereas if you ask about, uh, somebody's romantic partner or their family relationships, and if mm. they're doing well, you say, well, what's the secret? How are you mm. like, how, how are you making these wonderful relationships? And the tried and true responses. Oh, it takes so much work and just constantly working on them. Right. But with this, with friendship, we just have not built up that muscle, right. Of Mm -hmm. like understanding that any relationship worth anything that's going to give anything back to you requires work. There is no such thing as a relationship that's just kind of nice to have and is there. Mm -hmm. And so I think there needs to be a perspective shift around you know, understanding that it's not that there has to be a lot of heavy lifting, right? Mm. But we need to get processes in place to be able to evaluate how we're feeling in these relationships and then how to act on those feelings. Because right now it just, we all feel so extra being like, oh, let's talk about this friend breakup I had, or Mm. I'm not fulfilled in this relationship. It just feels like do you have a lot of time on your hands? Like what's wrong with you? Right. Yeah. Because we're not, we're just not used to doing it. Right. Mm. And, and, uh, and so I think, th- I think that's one of the first things, right. It just, it's just not a thing yet. And that was like my number one hope with, with the book is to mm. create language that could start conversations so that this doesn't feel like, you know, you're being dramatic or doing work that you don't need to, but that it's like, oh, right. This is a real thing. It's they're Mm. living, eating, breathing things that, that need us to pay attention to them if we want to get out of them what we can. Right. But I think, I think even before that is that, so the, the, key to any really good relationship, and this is going to sound kind of counterintuitive, is really having a good relationship with yourself and really having a profound understanding Mm. of yourself, or at least a basic profound understanding. And people are so afraid of doing that. Like Mm. people are, so I, I say that you need to have the answer to four basic questions. Mm -hmm. Um, who am I? Where am I? How did I get here? And where do I want to go? And this isn't something that you just scratch down on a piece of paper. You got to sit with these questions and really understand. And without understanding a a baseline answer to those questions, it's really hard to evaluate the relationships in your life, especially friendships, because how can your needs be met if you're not even sure what your needs are, right? If you haven't been, if you haven't been 
paying attention to yourself in that way. How, often we only know when a boundary's uh, like when a boundary's been crossed, when it's actually crossed. And sure. Oh wait, that didn't feel good. Yeah. So all of these things are reactive as opposed to proactive. Like just understanding at a base level what your non-negotiables are in these these relationships are, what you will tolerate, what you won't tolerate, what you need. And having a really clear vision of how you want to show up and be seen in the world is so important to then mm-hmm. having this mirrored through these through these relationships, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, th- but I think that's a really scary proposition. Sure. To, to people, right? As I said, yeah. like you're just chaos, 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 like busy, 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 over scheduled, o- over scrolled, over yeah. all of these yeah. things, and a lot of those things are now bad habits, but they are built upon this idea of, I can't send us, I can't spend a second alone with myself. Hmm. And, and the longer you don't do that, the more terrifying of a proposition that becomes. And, but the problem is the farther you, the longer you do that, the farther you get away from kind of what your core value proposition is and your core needs are. So it feels like this insurmountable, you know, thing to get on the other side of, but it's absolutely quintessential to do it, Mm -hmm. uh, obviously for your own self as an individual, but as you're looking to actively cultivate meaningful relationships, it's just, you have to know who you are and what you want so that then you can go out and get it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're kind of out there swinging blindly. And I think with friendships, you know, we do have to do that to a certain extent with romantic relationships Mm -hmm. because we're literally in, in, in theory locking the goal for, you know, most people is to like lock into like a long-term relationship with one person. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you do have to be a little strategic about that. But again, a lot of those things. Yeah. Well, I won't get into the romantic relationship, Mm -hmm. but, but, Mm -hmm. but, but, uh, yeah. But so I, I think there's just, we got to, sit down, sit with yourself and start really understanding, you know, some, and get some answers to some baseline questions before you go out and then start saying like, who are the Mm -hmm. right people for me? So I couldn't agree more. And that sort of internal work Mm -hmm. is step one. Yeah. Um, Or else we're just throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. And so that, and that is, you're right. That is, that's hard. That's, um, that takes intention and, um, we're really, um, familiar, I think with just operating on autopilot in that yeah, space. Totally. So that and this is very disruptive to like yeah. what we typically do. So having, having faced that and, and really sat with who we are, where we're going, what we want, yeah. how, and yeah. why, what happens then mm-hmm. when, we discover or feel or really admit um, Mm -hmm. that a friendship has become toxic Mm -hmm. or maybe it is simply that we have changed or they have, Um, you know, there's, there's more than one um, reason in there. But um, so if you could just talk generically understanding that these are different scenarios, but what are the, some of the signs, some Mm -hmm. of the common signs maybe, that yep. a friendship has, has turned toxic. And then the second part of the question, because I think this goes back to the deterrent, yeah. um, which is how do we release ourselves from the fear <laughs> of confrontation? Because I think that's what keeps us out of almost every totally. meaningful, honest mm-hmm. conversation is yeah. we just simply are afraid of the confrontation. We're afraid of conflict. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's go definitely- like, what are some red signs? Okay. How do we get over the hump of like our chosen silence because it's uncomfortable? Yeah. So I will parse out that there's a difference between toxic, uh, toxic relationships and then also relationships that just no longer serve you. And you kind Great. of. Great. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So because they are different. So a relationship that no longer serves you, you is something that you know, you could have been friends with somebody, you know, in your late teens or early twenties and, and really have seen some stuff with this person. They've really, you know, seen you evolve and you've seen them. 
and you've had this great kind of relationship. Mm. And then over the course of years, you to have gone in different directions, one yeah. not necessarily better than the other, just different, right? People, sure. move, people get married and all of these things can shift. And you can look up one day and say, wow, I feel like what happened to that relationship and, and, and start contemplating it. And when you're contemplating it, realize like, wow, I'm in such a different place right now. I don't feel like this, this relationship still fits where I am, though I am extremely like, uh, proud of or nostalgic for what it was. Mm -hmm. And in those circumstances, if you are just both naturally kind of, there is a distance growing between you, mm -hmm. there's almost nothing that you need to do, right? You can just pay attention to that and start to ap appreciate what it was from a point of nostalgia, as opposed to what it is now. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is if, is, is, is if you're not just going in two different directions, if one of you, and again, this is about the expectation, going back to the expectation, if one of you is still trying to engage the other, as though you are still in that past relationship. In other words, the person is trying to make plans with you or trying to connect with you on the phone or you're trying to, or role reversal, you're trying to engage her and they're, they're, that's not reciprocated. What can mm -hmm. happen in that situation is you start to get irritated. You start to feel guilty. Mm -hmm. You start to feel like, why isn't this person picking up on the fact that like, we're just not in the same place anymore. And what happens in that case is that then that starts to become the dominant energy and memory around that relationship, as opposed to all of the great mm. foundational stuff mm. that you guys had in the beginning. And so in that case, for me, it's worth having a conversation about where you are at from a bandwidth perspective, from an energy perspective, yeah. because you don't want to be pulling that thing that is actually otherwise quite a great loving mm source of positive energy when you look back onto it. And now it's become this kind of like passive aggressive. I don't know what to do here, but I'm feeling bad. And now that's the dominating feeling uh, when you think about this relationship. So that's one type of situation. Yeah. Very different than if you are realizing finding yourself in a toxic relationship, right? Uh -huh. um, Which could look like what? So, what are some of the big markers here? Yeah. So the first thing that you really, you know, what I, is like the big flashing light that we all, we never pay attention to is when you're with this person or you're engaged in this relationship, you f don't feel like yourself. In mm -hmm. other words, there is your leaning really into your persona. You are leaning, you are morphing yourself to kind of fit the energy that that relationship's mm. presenting, but you don't quite feel like yourself. Um, mm. and that's kind of hard to describe, but if you're yeah. paying attention, yeah. you'll start to say, ah, oh, like it, it's more of a felt sense. It's hard For to put sure. like that I know exactly what that feels feel like. like me. Like what, who yeah. was that person that just hung out with yeah. her? Is that me? That doesn't feel like me. That's not the way I show up in the rest mm. of the world. Right. So it's really, again, about paying attention to like how you're feeling. Um, just paying attention is the first thing. Right. Um, and then if you start acting in different ways, so if like in your life, you're normally, you know, you go to bed by 10 or 11 and, you know, you have your routines and every time you're with this person, you're off that doesn't mean mm. you can't with friends have, you know, the odd wild and crazy night. That's For sure. But when you're with this person, if you're always off your, your kind of base settings, mm. that's kind of like, that's okay. odd. This is something that is, taking me again, it's okay about kind of like, um, taking you away from yourself. Right. Yeah. Then <clears throat> another sign is going back to the positivity thing about one of the pillars. If you start to pay attention, realize every time you're with this person, you are engaging in things that are negative, negative talk, negative behavior, mm, mostly good. like if this person or if you, because people, mm. relationships can bring sides out of you that like lay dormant yeah. where you've got a hold on. If all of a sudden you're 
talking badly about people or you're mm. engaging in a way that's like at its core negative, you need to address Good. that. That's a big sign of, um, you know, this is, this might not be the right relationship for you. And another thing is just paying attention to your energy level, right? So there mm. are people there and there are real levels yeah. of toxic, right? And yeah. then there's relationships that just time and time again are not serving you and their mm. default setting <clears throat> is not great, right? <clears throat> and those mm. are the ones that are harder to really identify. But what you want to look for is every time I and finish hanging out with this person or get off a phone call yeah. or FaceTime. Yeah. Do I feel depleted mm-hmm. or do I feel energized? Right. When I see this person's name come up on a call display, yeah. am I jumping to pick up the phone or am I like, do I have like a pang of like, uh, uh, apprehension or what does she want? Or is it an eye roll? This is just little mini behaviors that if we start mm-hmm. paying attention to them, go, yeah. so, Oh, wow that's strange. I don't feel like that. Right. And that little phone litmus test is so easy to do. It's just watch how your, what happens when this person comes into your orbit. Right. So those are kind of the main things is like, do you feel differently than you do? Do you feel like off kilter? What's your energy like after once you've left them, are you behaving in ways that you don't normally? And is, are these relationships rooted in negativity? Um, almost exclusively, um, then these are, you want to kind of pay attention and say, okay, wait, how, how did I get into this friendship mm-hmm. and how do I get out of it? Yeah. How do I significantly, so you can also, one little caveat, you can also be in a relationship that started out differently, right? So yeah. if you identify like, wait, I don't feel good. I feel so depleted by this person. Da, 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 and you, mm-hmm. you look at the landscape of the friendship, often you'll say, oh, you know what? this has been always the way this has been. I was just in a different headset. So like, if you're going through something in life, you are, you can like fall into relationships that like feel good mm. because either they're manic or the person's paying a lot of attention to you when you need it. Sure. And then you come up for air a couple of years and go later and go, what? Uh, oh, what? Mm. How did I get into this? Oh, right. I wasn't my best self when I got into this. Or you can have relationships that start out really good and really genuine and healthy. And over the course of, you know, the relationship, they've shifted into something different. If Mm. that's the case, you've got to ask yourself, how did we get here? Were there Mm. any like major kind of life happenings that took this off kilter as opposed to this just being personality? Like this is, these are the wrong two personalities together. Mm. And is it worth saving? Is, do I think like, if I could get this back on track, would it, would that be meaningful? Would that, what, how would I feel about that? Mm. If the answer is I'm done, I don't think, I don't think I want this, even if I could get it back. Now there's also something to do about that. So the first thing that you need to do is, and when I'm talking about these relationships, I'm talking about these relationships, um, like they've had some length of time they've had some value and i think just culturally we hear this word toxic all the time Mm. to the point of like i don't want to hear it anymore Mm. but i have people coming into my office all the time being like oh talking about friendship actually and be like she's so toxic he's so toxic and i always stop them and i say hold on a second well it is true that they're individuals themselves can be just toxic people. Mm -hmm. That is such a small percentage of people, right? Mm. It is in this case, the relationship that is toxic. And even Mm. if someone else is behaving badly, right? You've allowed them to continue to show up this with this way in your life. We teach people how to treat us. And there's a certain degree of responsibility we need to own within these relationships because with responsibility comes freedom and power, right? And that feels counterintuitive. Like, yo, she's being like this and da, da, da. Yeah, but you allowed it. Often people that are toxic have other, you know, quote, and I say quote unquote, when I mean the relationship is actually what is fueling a lot of this, have perfectly fine relationships Mm. with other people. But Mm. there's something about 
the dynamic and what you've allowed. And again, I'm not trying to blame the victim. There are people that are genuinely behaving badly and they need to be held accountable. And that's why you will end up taking them out of your life. But it's a missed opportunity to just say they were toxic. They're the bad thing. And now I'm throwing the whole thing out. That's good. It's really valuable to say what in me, mm-hmm. felt like I needed this. Yeah. What was I getting from this? Cause I was getting something. Mm-hmm. I kept it going. Or was it that I, just wasn't paying attention to what I needed. And I kept pushing that down. Why was I doing that? Don't want to do that again. Don't mm-hmm. ever get in this situation. Yeah, that's great. And the idea here really is to be able to get, you know, to take the relationships that aren't serving you away, mm-hmm. but moving forward to start showing up with honesty and, 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 and with a different level of intention so that you don't get to that place in the first place. Right. Mm-hmm. So like when starting new friendships, like showing up in a different way, the idea is, yeah. So anyways, once you've decided that this relationship is not, not good and you need to get rid of it, the first thing I ask you to do is to really visualize your life without this person Hmm. and be able to almost in a way pre-grieve it or at least... Hmm. They like, how is my life going to shift and alter? Because what happens often is people get up the courage to break up with somebody. And then nine times out of 10, that person that is being broken up with won't accept that and Mm -hmm. tries to get you back. Sure. It's to not have this for for a variety of psychological reasons. Nobody likes to be left, right? And so if you haven't really taken the time to say like, okay, to steep yourself in this a little bit, it's so easy to get off, off kilter and be like, oh yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe. And, and to give in to kind of the anxiety and the pressure of the moment. And then what happens is like the next morning you, you feel so heavy, you feel still conflicted. You're still in this relationship, but you have, you've taken the step to break up. And now here you are back again, where it's like, but I'm still not out of this. So, and it's, it's amazing how easily we can get talked back into things. So Mm -hmm. to really take that extra kind of beat and time to say, okay, what is my my world like with this person not in it? Yeah. And then what you have to do is you have to decide. So for me, especially if it's been a really long and meaningful relationship, you, um, you want to lead with the highest, you, you know, the, 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 the action with the most respect and courage, That's which good. is to talk to somebody in person or maybe it's a FaceTime, like That's to good. really, um, you know, have just this to, honor it, to honor it, to honor the, it. Yeah. To honor it. Exactly. And to, to show up, you know, out of respect and like, you really mean it also. Right. Mm. Um, so, but the main idea is to have your message land. So if you are dealing with a person who you've identified as highly reactive or highly defensive, and a lot of times in these toxic relationships, there is at least one person who has big emotions and is a little more dramatic. And that's probably why they've been a lot of fun. (laughs) Also along the way, that's the kind of like that big unpredictable energy. Hmm. It's kind of seductive. So the flip side of that is if you're going to be delivering a message like this, which is a really hard one, what often happens is you will talk to them and you'll deliver your message and they can't hold it even for a second and they throw it right back on you. Right. And it becomes this big drama. The idea. So, so then that, that doesn't work because nothing will have landed. Right. So in that case, it's better to put, something down really thoughtfully in an email, yeah. Yeah, probably not a text, but an email. So the person can have their big reaction yeah, and then have something to come back to. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that. Because the yeah. idea is just like, mm-hmm. then they have their process and hopefully they will come back to it and they might fire off a, diff, you know, like a reactive email, but they still have this thing to come back. So, because you yeah. want them to understand, right? Like, this isn't a personal attack. This is that this relationship no longer serves me. And that's why it's really important to have language around that, like how you deliver that message. And to your point, those, those can look really and should look really different between a conversation with a friend 
who was, for lack of a better word, seasonal. Yeah. Uh, yes. And totally. one that is harmful and like Absolutely. that is genuinely, you are not the, your best yeah. person with them. So those are two right. different Very conversations different and conversation. postures. And yeah, but both are really possible. And um, uh, my sense of adult friendships is that in general, mm-hmm. most of us, I think, actually know. Like, this isn't a mystery. Yeah. It's, we don't not it, know it, when it, a friend it, pops up on our phone and we're like, <sighs> yeah, we're just pushing it down. Yeah, we're just pushing it down. Or yeah. we're just saying, oh, it's fine. I'll just, I can do anything for an hour, you know, or we, we just think, I don't know what. But if yeah. we're honest, it's not that heavy of a lift for most of us to be able to say, I know what these are in my life, Um, you know, to various degrees, whatever it is um, that they are. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes, even often, we're faced with tough choices, all of us, really. Sometimes the path forward isn't that clear at all. So, I mean, really, show me a human person who hasn't dealt with this. I mean, decisions around, I mean, you name it, career, relationships, family, So many things. And I've been there, of course. And therapy helped me. It helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate everything life throws at you. So you can move forward, not just with confidence, but even like excitement. I've learned that trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. Like the more you practice it, the easier it gets. And so if you're thinking of trying therapy, just Think about trying BetterHelp. It's entirely online. It's convenient and flexible, suited to your schedule. Just fill out a really brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if you need to. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash For the Love today and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash For the Love. I just want to ask you one last question because um, it's always more comfortable just to (laughs) frame this up on the shoulders of the other person. Like, well, this person is the problem or this friend got, this friend is not good for me or this friend is even all the way to the toxic category or this, but also sometimes the call is coming from inside the house. Sometimes I, we are the problem right? and the way Absolutely. that we are in relationship with people is not healthy and not good for us or for them. And so just by way of self-evaluation and honesty, right. what would you say it means? And we can think of these in personal terms. What does it mean to be a good friend? Like what kind of self-work Do we need to do as individuals um, to get to that place um, so that we can genuinely self-evaluate and say, these are areas in which I could really show some improvement in my friendships? Yeah. Well, I think that I I think the first thing, again, like it always comes down to is that awareness piece and saying, I'm going to wait, I'm going to actually take a look at myself. I'm going to take a look at how I'm showing up in these friendships. And um, I, and and in one chapter of the book, there's, I have a whole list of like friendship, um, like types and friendship how you show up and so get, and how you show up in friendship. So like when I was talking right at the beginning about, I was like, Oh, I'm somebody that shows up and people come to me as the fixer. So just understanding mm. like, Oh, right. That's the way it's not about labeling it, but it's about yeah. having an understanding of like your role in the world, your role within these relationships. And then does that feel like me? Yes, it does. What am I not doing? Okay, I know what I am doing then, but what am I not doing? And then mm. looking at all of the other kind of ways in the which the ways in the world in which that you can show up, right? You want to open the aperture as much as you can. It's good. And so there's that. There's also something that I think is really interesting. Like one of the most interesting things about friendship for me is that it's a, their relations, right? But so much of it goes back to the individual. And 
these types of relationships, I, I have this, Aristotle was very, very um, interested in studying friendships and what those relationships meant. And so he has a whole thing on, on the power of what friendships are and what the kind of cliff notes is that these relationships are very much a mirror to you. And mm. the more you explore these types of relationships, the more you explore yourself, right? And so to that end, understanding who you, is in your world is really important to understanding who you are. Mm. And you want to be razor focused on, on not having, um, when you look at that kind of starting lineup, not having created an echo chamber. In other words, every single yeah. person is reasonably like you right? Mm -hmm. Why do, why do I not have a wider swath of people here? What do I, what does that reflect on me? What am I afraid of? What, how, how, you know, look, so again, looking back to yourself mm -hmm. and it's, it's really, really important. And, and mm -hmm. then understanding your attachment style, which is really, really important, which mm -hmm. some people it, just like the quick, Again, cliff notes, when you're born, you have caregivers. If your caregivers met all of your immediate needs, um, you know, food, clothing, shelter, yeah. affection, you'll have a secure attachment. If they, if there was yeah. stuff going on or one of them wasn't there and there's a, or they weren't nice or they didn't meet needs, there's a whole other category, like insecure attachment, avoidant attachment that can, that you were brought into the world. And that's sure. all how you're showing up in your adult relationships or other people are showing up in a way that is not like you. And so understanding, Oh, where did that come from? Maybe I can work on that. Mm. Or maybe I have a secure attachment Good. in my world. Doesn't yeah. having an understanding like, Oh, okay. Got it. This is why she always is nervous. If I, if I, if I don't want to make every plan with her. Right. So it's not like it's just having a better understanding of where people are coming from, but it starts with you. Of course, the most important is to say, how did I kind of come into this world and how am I showing up now? And is that how I want to show up? And if right. not, do I need to do my own work with a the therapist? Do I need to mm -hmm. talk about the way I'm feeling with my friend and say, I, I've noticed that I feel really nervous when you cancel plans and I just want to, that's not a you thing. I've looked back and said, oh, looking back on it, I think that's a me thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to work on that or I'm now paying attention to that. Um, hmm. So yeah, again, it so much of this comes back to you. Yeah. Start with how you felt showing up on that playground in your earliest memories. Were that's you yeah. nervous? Were you, did you, were you bullied? Were you the life yeah. of the party? Were you, you know, whatever. Yeah. Is that how you want to be now? Because the good news is a lot of this is about choice. You can, we know now with sure. like neuroplasticity and all this stuff, it's sure. just about creating new neural pathways and That's new right. behaviors, but you can't do that until you have the awareness piece. That's right. So that is so good and so useful. And frankly, will serve obviously not only our friendships, but every relationship we're in. Yeah. Um, this, that starting place of self-evaluation is the beginning of every good piece of meaningful change yeah. and the foundation for healthy relationships. And so, um, I love that you include that. So like robustly and okay. that that is a big part of the process, um, because it should be. And so there is so much more, I mean, we have barely scratched the surface. Um, and I am so just glad to have this conversation with you, Erin, and excited to send people to your book, which they can get anywhere, right? Can you tell my community, look, sure. there's so much more here. So, so, so much more. I mean, this is just this, the, the tip of the iceberg. So where can they find you? Um, how, where can they follow you, find out more of your work and obviously get your book? Um, yes. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, you can find the book anywhere you buy books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, indie booksellers. Um, and you can find me at, um, at Aaron Falconer on all things social or at pick the brain on all things social, which is my blog and pick the brain.com. Perfect. And everybody, I'll round all those up for you in one fell swoop. So you could just click, click, <laughs> click all the way through. Um, 
Thank you so much for being here. And I, this is the absolute final question. And I ask all my guests this. So every guest, every series, and I would love for you to feel free to answer it however you feel like today. It can, you could give me a really like earnest answer or just absurdity. It, okay. We like it all. Um, okay. So this is the question. Um, I borrowed it from Barbara Brown Taylor, who's an Episcopal priest that I love. Um, yeah. And her question is, what is saving your life right now? What is saving my life right now? Um, well, I would say this is what, okay, this is going to sound counterintuitive. This is what kind of always saves my life. I literally right. prescribe this with okay. in therapy to okay. basically all my clients. And that is to try and access comedy. Oh, yeah. Access- to find, uh, y- you know, whether it's a funny podcast, whether it's YouTube clips, uh, Netflix, literally yeah. every day you need to laugh. I think the world is a very serious place yeah. and a very heavy place. And it is our job to offset some of that and to Good. be able to find the counter, you know, and I, I used to be a stand-up comedian when I was like yeah. 16, 17, 18. So I have yeah. a fond place in my heart for comedy. Sure. But I say that not just to laugh, although just laughing is amazing um because it's necessary yeah. and that's part of the job we got to be intentional and again it's about that it that's feels right. so easy to lean into the negativity because yeah. you felt held and did a, but that can't be the only narrative that's spinning in our heads we have to find counterpoints and yeah. laughter is that counterpoint so couldn't be, agree be, more yeah i love that i don't think i've ever had anybody um, give that answer in five years do you see so, how seriously also I'm saying it? Like there's not a drop of humor in what I'm saying. Yeah. But I, I, <laughs> normally I'm very funny, but I'm very serious about yeah. people accessing humor and great. laughter. That's great. Great answer. I love it. Um, thank you again for being on the show today. Thank you for all of your time. I'm excited to bring my community like to the table here to learn from you and um, super grateful for your work in the world. This matters. Like thank this you. is absolutely improving people's lives. And so well done and great to meet you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, guys. I mean, really, we didn't even get to all of it. I had like three or four other questions I didn't even have time for. So there's more to discover under, um, Aaron's work umbrella of work. And so as promised, if you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I will have all these links rounded up for you. Also including the show notes, if you would like to share this episode and, um, all of Aaron's socials and links to her book and just absolutely everything. And so, um, and if you haven't already go ahead and rate review and definitely subscribe to the, to the podcast. Um, we're delighted to just automatically show up in your feed every single week. We, it's just such our, it's just a joy to serve you in this, in this podcast. And we work, there's a whole group of us that just works tirelessly at it. And so, um, thank you for all your responses to the show and being such loyal listeners. You are just such a phenomenal community. So, so much more to come in this incredible series and we hope it serves you well. See you next week, guys.